All right. Hello, travelers. Welcome to Show and Tell with Reach the World. For over 20 years, Reach the World has used virtual exchange to inspire youth to become curious, confident global citizens. My name is Tim, and as part of Reach the World's efforts to support educators and families during the COVID-19 epidemic, we'll be sharing free live stream show and tell events with fascinating members of our global community. We hope you'll join us for this virtual journey. You can find an updated calendar of live stream events and much more at our new website at athome.reachtheworld.org. We are kicking off show and tell today with an explorer who so many of our students know well through our virtual exchange with the Weddell Sea Expedition to Antarctica. I'm so excited to welcome back Ocean Infinity's Holly Ewart. As Holly's talking, be sure to let us know you're here and share any questions for her using the YouTube chat bar. We'll get to as many questions as we can. But without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Holly. And I'm going to ask her the question that's on all of our minds. What have you brought to show us today? Hi, Tim. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you guys about an expedition that I went on last January into the Antarctic, which is one of the most remote places on the globe. So I went into an area called the Weddell Sea. Um, and that's what I will be telling you guys all about today. Right, so I'm going to share my screen because I have some amazing photographs from the expedition with you guys. So if this all works, right, okay. So I'm gonna be telling you guys a bit about exploring Antarctica. Um, I was lucky enough to be part of a phenomenal expedition into Antarctica. Um, due to uh, the Flotilla Foundation and Ocean Infinity. And this was the Weddell Sea Expedition 2019. So we set off from Cape Town on a research vessel called the SA Agullis II. This was a South African polar icebreaker. And what that means is that this ship is specifically designed to break through a huge amount of ice. And this ship allowed us to explore parts of Antarctica that haven't been explored for over 100 years. So this was the SA Agullis II. It's a South African polar icebreaker. Um, and we had a phenomenal and international and diverse team of people on board our expedition. In this photograph, you can see our captain, who was Captain Knowledge Bengu, with Freddie Lighthelm and Sibongile Azizi. And these were, this was the team that really looked after us and led us into this remote part of Antarctica. Um, Antarctica is the southern point, just for those of you who might, might be unaware. There's the North Pole and the South Pole. The South Pole is penguins, um, the Antarctic, and the North Pole is the Arctic and polar bears. So we were in the South Pole with lots and lots of penguins, which I will come to. So on our expedition, we had a as I said, really diverse group of people. We had people from South Africa, New Zealand, Europe, England. Um, and we also had a really good mix of men and women on board our expedition. It was totally inspiring to be part of such a diverse group of scientists, polar explorers, technicians, and crew. But how on earth did we get to Antarctica? And this is a question I've been asked loads of times because it is not an easy place to get to. Antarctica is not somewhere you can just jump in the back of your car to and drive to. We had to get three different flights, one helicopter, and also got crane lifted in a basket onto the back of the vessel. This is a Russian fighter plane called a Basler. And as you can see, it's been designed to operate in remote icy locations. There are skis. I don't know if you can see my mouse but there are skis on the bottom of the plane, which allows it to land on really icy um, terrain. In fact, when we landed on a jet to the research base called Penguin Bukta, we actually landed on an ice runway. It was epic. So after getting on the Russian Basler, we got a helicopter and this was thrilling. I have never been on a helicopter before. I didn't have the courage to have my leg out like this person did. Um, but we were lifted in a helicopter, really noisy, and we landed on the back deck of the ship. And the back deck is the area that is literally at the back of the ship. Um, but some people had to travel on and off 
in a basket. Now, what you can't see in this photograph is that here are the harnesses, which are attached to a basket, which is attached to a crane, which is part of the ship. So we actually, every time we wanted to go and investigate what, get scientific samples from the ice, we had to be lifted by a crane on a basket over the Antarctic ice. And then of course, there was the traveling through the ice. And I mentioned we were on a polar icebreaker. This ship was phenomenal. It could break through really thick layers of ice. And this video I'm about to show you is a time-lapse. So for those of you who don't know what a time-lapse is, this video was taken over several hours and sped up. And this just gives you a small idea of the, the remoteness that we were traveling through and also the difficult areas that we were traveling through. So you can see here, this is us breaking through ice. And breaking through ice is like being in a thunderstorm. It's very noisy. In fact, one night it got so intense that I had to tie myself to my bed as to not fall out of my bed in my cabin. Very intense. Um, we even had mechanics on board who were measuring the capabilities of the vessel. I'm about to come on, on to what, what science we did when we were in Antarctica. So there is a risk being in Antarctica um, that you might, just might get stuck in the ice. Um, it's a really difficult place to operate. And we actually did at one point, well, two points, I'll come on to the latter one in a minute, get stuck in the ice. And luckily enough, we had really forward thinking, bright captains who came up with this process to break us free from the ice. And I will show you. So this is the crane I was talking about. And we lifted in a very heavy crater and swung it side to side as to gain momentum so that we could break free from the ice. There you have it. So quite a nerve wracking moment when the captain says to you, we're stuck in the ice, we've got to think about what we need to do. And this is the way that we use modern technology to resolve being stuck in the ice in Antarctica. Now, so there were two main reasons why we went to Antarctica. And the first was to investigate the effects of climate change on the region. So we had a team of leading scientists to do this to see the rate in which the ice was melting, to see what actually lives in Antarctica and how well preserved the ecosystem is. But we also followed in the steps of a great polar explorer called Shackleton, whose ship got stuck in the ice in 1915, which I'm about to come on to. So what actually lives in Antarctica? And before we went there, we didn't really know because not many people have explored this part of the Weddell Sea. I was amazed to see the abundance of marine life that was in Antarctica. Because not many people have explored it, it's really well preserved. We haven't disrupted the marine life in Antarctica. So in this photograph, you can actually see a minke whale. And in this photograph, this photograph was taken with the whale about eight feet underneath the water. But because the water there is so well preserved and the ecosystem is so uninterrupted, the water was so clear and crystal blue that you could actually see eight feet uh, to see the whale underneath the water. And because it's been not overfished, the Antarctic food, uh, food cycle is, is quite well preserved. So the krill haven't been overfished, which means the fish are safe, which means the penguins can feed, which means the whole food chain seems to be working. So, Ah, this one I was going to say. If anyone knows who this tail belongs to, if anyone can guess what whale this tail belongs to, comment um, on the, I think on the link, there should be a comment section and let me know who you think this tail might belong to. Extra points, virtual points for whoever might guess it. And there were also seals. There were loads of seals and different types of seals. In fact, one morning we got woken up by the voyage leader who asked us all to peer outside of our cabin windows. And when I looked outside of my window, I saw possibly 200 seals all sunbathing on the ice. And this ties into what I was saying earlier. 
these marine animals haven't seen humans. They don't, they don't interact in our world. We were visitors in their world. We were being given the honor to see how these seals and penguins and whales all live. And they were quite curious. They were sunbathing, watching the ship go past. When we were out on the ice, they were coming, sort of waddling over to say hello. And of course there were penguins. So this is a King Emperor penguin, beautiful, beautiful penguins. And they are also very curious. They haven't seen humans. They don't know who we are. What are these weird creatures on the ice? These are a daily penguins. And in fact, these ones are very cheeky and super, super curious. Um, my friend Bettina was working on the ice, gathering scientific samples when one of these waddled up behind her and actually nipped her on the bottom. So they're very curious and we are not allowed to go close to them. We have to respect that this is their area, this is their land, this is their home. We can't interrupt any of their existence, but that's not to say that they can't come over and see us. <laughs> so that's what's on top of the ice, but what's actually beneath the ice? So we were really fortunate because we worked with a company called Ocean Infinity who operate marine robots all over the world in the ocean. And the ocean is so little investigated. So we had two types of robots. One, which is this one, which is called an ROV, which is a remotely operated system. So to put it like this, for those of you who have ever played Xbox or PS4 or games consoles, imagine that the control that you have to operate your Xbox actually is connected to a robot that is 3,000 meters underneath the water. That's how the, marine, the remotely operated vehicle works. And it has little pincers, so it can actually pick things up. Just here are the pincers. So it's controlled from the shore by people, but it operates really deep, up to 6,000 meters deep under the water. And then this one here is called an AUV, an autonomous underwater vehicle. And these are sent underneath the ocean. They're pre-programmed to take photographs and acoustic images of what might be under the ocean. So these are used widely to locate shipwrecks, really. So you can see what the, the seabed might look like. But we also looked what under the ice might look like. So we were really lucky to have such cutting edge technology to allow us to investigate in ways that people haven't before in the Antarctic. So if you send one of these robots under the water without lights on, this is what you see. But if you send an ROV under the water and you turn the lights on, this is what you see. So actually underneath the ice in Antarctica is a huge amount of marine life, brightly colored corals, and in fact, in this image, which the marine biologists from the Necton Foundation and University of Oxford sent to us, you can actually spot something very exciting. Just here is an octopus. So about a thousand meters underneath the ice was an octopus. So we haven't just got penguins on the ice or whales in the water and birds in the air. We've actually got incredible marine life underneath the ice that needs to be protected. But of course, we were there um, in the Weddell Sea, very near the sinking site of the famous endurance ship. So Sir Ernest Shackleton was a polar explorer who in 1914 set out with a crew of men on the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition. And they set sail in a wooden ship into the heart of the Weddell Sea. We followed the same path that they took, but unfortunately in 1915, they got stuck in the ice, but they didn't have a crane to swing side to side to release them from the ice. They got stuck in the ice just enclosed and enclosed and it actually crossed the ship and the ship sank to 3000 meters under the water. But what was so amazing about this expedition is that all the crew members survived and they lived on the ice and they escaped on foot and they took these lifeboats and managed to find safe refuge at Elephant Island. It's an incredible story and I wish I could go into more into it, but we haven't got enough time. So I'm gonna show you a few more images and I'm sure if you have any questions about the endurance expedition, do just, just pop them on the, on the comment section. So this is a photograph, quite a famous photograph that was taken from the, Weddell, from the 
not the Weddell Sea Expedition, from Shackleton's Endurance Expedition. So this here is the endurance in the back, and this is the crew here. And this is Shackleton in goal himself. So we thought, as the Weddell Sea Expedition, the 21st century version with men and women and people from all over the globe, let's recreate this photo. So we had our very own football match on the ice. So here you can see voyage leader John Shears. I'm here somewhere, Bettina's here somewhere, and there's the Agullas too. But something that I have to say, not only have I never played a, a football or soccer match on the ice, but I've also never in my life, apart from this time, had a pitch invasion from uh, penguins. So halfway through the football match, we had some curious friends come to say hello, um, to come join us in the football match. Of course, we had to stop out of you know respect to the penguins. We didn't want a football accidentally going near them. But they did come and say hello, which was a phenomenal experience. And we did make it to where the endurance was stuck in the ice and sank in 1915. Um, unfortunately, because the ice there is it's so remote and it's so cold and it's such a it's such a difficult place to operate that the ship itself, the Agullas II, actually got stuck in ice itself. So Captain Knowledge Bengu had to make a really difficult decision. Do we stay and keep searching for the endurance at the risk of our people and the boat while the ice encloses around us and we might get stuck? We don't know if we have enough food or resources to do that, or do we turn around and keep our people safe? And when it comes to operating in a really remote and harsh environment, safety does come first. So we turned around and we unfortunately had to leave one of the marine robots to make a safe passage back home. But we did make it to the sinking site of the Endurance. Um, and before we left, we managed to get in a quick game of cricket. Um, so we played a game of cricket over where the Endurance sank in 1915. And this is a photograph of the whole team. It was a phenomenal experience with people that have inspired me and we were all excited. Um, a really unforgettable once in a lifetime experience. So thank you so much to Reach the World for enabling us to be able to talk about these things, um, to share with you an expedition that I never thought I would have had an opportunity to go on. Um, and I've seen the program, it's incredible. Go to the link uh, at home.reachtheworld.org to find more people doing show and tells um, of their other adventures around the world. Thank awesome, you. Holly. Thank you so much. I that There's so many, things, uh, so many questions I have about that story, so many great uh, twists and turns, and, and I want to try to get to some of the questions that were left in the, the chat bar. Um, there's definitely a few guesses as to what that tail might have been that was sticking out of the water. We have one guess uh, that it was a humpback whale, perhaps. It was a humpback whale, yes. All right, we have a winner. Uh, fantastic job. Um, there's a lot of interest also around the, the wildlife situation in Antarctica. And uh, I share our audience's fascination with that because you think a place that's so barren and so cold and so remote and so dark under the water would just be devoid of life. Um, can you um, talk a little bit more about what kind of penguins you, you saw and, and just maybe one thing that surprised you about the wildlife situation? Yeah, definitely. Um... The penguins were really, really amazing and they're, they're sort of iconic to Antarctica and there were two main types, the Adelie penguins, which were the small ones, and the King Emperor penguins, which were the taller ones. So I don't know if any of you have seen Happy Feet, which is a great movie. Um, there are the sort of smaller penguins and the larger penguins and those are the two main penguins that we saw in Antarctica. Um, the marine life there, I, I'm not a scientist, but but I was amazed to be able to see how quite how much marine life there was there. Um, in the rest of Antarctica, there is quite a lot of fishing going on, but in the Weddell Sea, there isn't because it's not accessible to most people. You have to have, as I showed you, an enormous ice-breaking vessel. So it's a really uh, undisturbed part of the globe, um, which means that the food chain is really well-preserved and the krill haven't been overfished, which means that the fish around there get their food and that means the penguins get their food and so on and so forth. 
So really it is, it's a sort of, it's, it's a hub of bustling, exciting marine life. And I, I didn't expect to see that either. But we were also there in the summer. So one thing I didn't mention was that while we were there, the sun never set. There was daylight 24 seven. Um, and that's what happens in the Antarctic. And then in the winter, it's pretty much dark the whole time. So there, there was sunshine, the animals were out. Um, I think it would have been quite a different experience had we gone in the winter, but we wouldn't have been able to go. Wow, that's amazing. Um, we, have, we have another question about the, the human element in Antarctica. How many people were a part of the Weddell Sea Expedition? And do you know generally how many people are, are living, scientists and other people are, are living and working in Antarctica at one yeah, time? Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so on our expedition, we were 44 um, scientists, technicians and polar explorers. And then the crew who were from South Africa, who were an amazing bunch, there were about 60 of them. So in total, we were, we were just, we were about a hundred people living in, in, on that boat for about two months. Um, there are scientific bases in Antarctica. Um, it's, it's, there are Russian bases, British bases, Chinese bases. There are, there are loads of different research bases in Antarctica. Um, I'm not sure exactly how many people live there throughout the year, but on the base that I went to, I would say that there were about 40 scientists working and they do six month shifts. So they go and live in Antarctica for six months and then they swap with somebody else. All right. Um, you mentioned briefly the, the science that was performed as part of the Weddell Sea expedition. Um, do you, is, is the expedition was last winter, I'm wondering if, if do you know anything about the findings that the scientists had um, as a result of their research? Yeah, it's really hard to tell. Um, I think the scientists only because, because Antarctica is so far away, the ship, the, the samples that they gathered um, of the ice so that they can tell what actually the ice is made up of, how quickly it's melting, the currents within the water, that they, they only got that data back um, halfway through the summer last year. So actually it's quite a lengthy process, you know, going through the scientific data. Um, and then they have to write up all their findings. So actually we're, in, we're right now in the process of all these scientists working in their labs across the globe, trying to see what actually was happening. Great, yeah, I can imagine that's a big task. Definitely. Um, Anybody else who's joining us on live stream, if you'd like to get a question in for Holly, we have her with us for about six or seven more minutes. So feel free to drop it in uh, the chat bar. And in the meantime, um, what if somebody was interested in, in exploring Antarctica or doing what you do for your job, how could they do that? How could somebody become an explorer or, or an ocean adventurer uh, for their career? Yeah, I mean, there's there's. I think it seemed like a really inaccessible thing to do, but actually it's not. There, there are loads of opportunities um, for everyone if they want to go into, into ocean exploration. Um, you can work on a vessel, so you can actually be part of a crew who spend their, most of their time at sea exploring places. Um, so you can be a captain, you can be a chef, you can be um, a navigational officer, you can, you can look after the people on the ship, you can be a doctor. Um, if you want to go specifically to Antarctica, um, getting into science, getting into exploration, history, um, really the, the, op the options are endless. I mean, I, I think the way to really start building it is look around the areas close to you. When you're where you are at home, you know, working in parks nearby, seeing what, what inhabits the parks, you know, there are so many wonderful programs that, that you can get involved with. And actually it's, it's doing stuff like getting involved in online learning about conservation or, or you know, marine life really. Um, but there's a whole plethora of things. It doesn't just have to be science. I'm not a scientist, you know, it, it can be history. It can be working on ships. Yeah, there's, there's loads of different things that you can do. Um, Fantastic. I, I'm wondering from the, the moment you left your door in London to the moment you returned to your home, how long were you away as part of the Waddell Sea Expedition? Yeah, that's a good question. A long time. Um, I left on New Year's Eve of 2018 and I returned um, about two months later. 
so the end of February. So I was I was in Antarctica for for just under I think just about seven weeks, and then with the travel it was about eight weeks. But there were some people who actually sailed with the vessel, so they were on the ship for about from about just before Christmas. I can't remember when they set sail, but they were on the ship for three four months. They were along for a long time. Wow. From from your perspective, what is the most exciting part about being on a ship for that long? And what's one of the biggest challenges about being on a ship for that long? Good question. Um, the most exciting part about being on a ship that long is what you get to see. Um, I think waking up and having icebergs and ice flows and penguins and then permanent sunshine and just just things that I never thought I would have been able to to be exposed to or seen um that was amazing and and actually the camaraderie in that the the coming together as a team and and seeing those things with people who you know like I said a really diverse group of people um from all over the world you know you were now that team that was on the Weddell Sea expedition was sort of linked because we we shared this experience all together um and then the challenging thing of course is you're so far away from home you know you're really you feel as if you're in another world it could be going to space um so while it's really exciting there are times when you just miss home comforts there's not really very good internet despite reach the world managing to get us live streaming during it which was phenomenal um but yeah, I think that there, there are challenges and it's not, it's, to be honest, it's not dissimilar from the situation we're in today. You know, we're all inside, we're all having to really look at what, what we can do to be creative and engaged. Um, and it was similar actually in Antarctica. I mean, obviously we're in Antarctica, but you had to keep yourself occupied. You didn't have, you didn't even have things like watching TV, really. We had to read books and play games um, and, and be with each other and create a really strong network and support each other. Great. Well, that is a perfect segue into the last question that I'm hoping to ask all of our show and tell participants over the course of the next few months. As we're all sort of trapped in our homes and our ability to travel is limited and we're all thinking about where we might like to go as soon as we can return to normal. Uh, what will be your next adventure as soon as you are released from confinement? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think I'd like to go, well, there's nothing set in stone. I'll start with that. Um, we haven't we haven't got a big expedition planned just yet, but I'd like to go back. Um, I I think there's a lot of things, I, a lot of places I'd like to go to. Um, I don't really anywhere, anywhere at sea, anywhere to travel, anywhere to see the world. I think you know, opening avenues I, I never thought I I could go to before. Um, I'd like to do the Arctic. I'd like to go and see some polar bears. All right. Yeah, that sounds great. That sounds like a great next adventure. Well, Holly, I want to thank you so much. And, and I'm really excited over the course of the next few months, we're going to get to connect with a few of your colleagues as well from Ocean Infinity and hear more about exploring our oceans, which is a topic of endless fascination. So thank you so much. And thank you to our entire YouTube live stream audience for joining us today. You can join us again on Wednesday at the same time, same place, when we're going to be talking with Gilman Scholar, Quinn Carolyn, who's going to tell us all about what it's like to work at a U.S. embassy abroad. Uh, you can find a complete list of upcoming Reach the World live stream events at athome.reachtheworld.org. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Holly. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, everyone. Bye.